Welcome to the programme. I'm Nima Abuwardi and this week we're at Dubai's International Financial Centre and it's the investors here that one small island is trying to attract. Bermuda, which has one of the world's biggest reinsurance industries, is trying to woo Gulf investors to put their money there. But what's in it for this region? We'll be finding out. Also coming up this week... Headaches in healthcare. Qatar's fast growing population is putting pressure on the country's health system. So, how will it cope? Taking a stab in the dark, how Oman's government is helping to ensure the ceremonial dagger's survival and create employment. The upside of a downturn, why young people are doing well out of cost cutting. And we find out how these cartoon characters have become Dubai's unlikely superheroes. But first, Qatar might be a small country, but it's going big places and fast. It's got the world's fastest growing economy, a rapidly expanding population, and it's putting itself on the map by doing things like buying Harrods and bidding to host the Football World Cup. But when a country expands this rapidly, it puts a strain on its infrastructure and key services. So Stephanie Hancock has been finding out how Qatar's healthcare system is coping. The emergency unit at Hamad General, the biggest and busiest hospital in Qatar. Every day, more than 1,500 patients are treated here, a huge workload for any emergency department, let alone in one of the world's smallest countries. Hamad Hospital is government-owned and run and is the true front line of the country's healthcare system. Qatar might be a relatively small country, but its population growth, fuelled by an oil and gas boom, has been astronomical. The population here has more than doubled over the past six years. And that growth has put pressure on the country's infrastructure, not least its health system. But Qatar is now spending more per capita than any other country in the Gulf on expanding its healthcare system. So inevitable pressures are such that the, the infrastructure for healthcare is old at this time. Even though it is changing, it has not caught up with the rapid growth as yet. As we speak, the Supreme Council of Health is planning for a transformation of the healthcare system. They are building for the next generation, for the longer term, and uh, they are going to succeed. But it is going to take a while. Over the next few years, several new hospitals and clinics will be built across Qatar, some public, some private. This need for more health facilities is not unique to Qatar. Across the Gulf, another 25,000 hospital beds are needed in less than a decade to satisfy growing demand. But those working in healthcare here, like veteran Dr. Abdul Wahab, who leads Hamad's emergency unit, say investment is about more than simply building extra hospitals. The biggest challenge is the actual uh, resources. It's not the facilities, it's not number of beds, it's not the capacity. I think that's the easy part, you know, the, you can easily double or triple the amount of uh, beds and, uh, uh, you know, equipment and so on. The difficult part is to have um, a competent quality level of medical staff, nursing staff, Hi, Mr. Abdul. Good morning. I'm Sai. I'm a student nurse and I'm with my instructor today, Ms. Leanne. Hi, Mr. Abdul. Here at the University of Calgary in Qatar, the country's medical staff of the future are being trained. This university offers the only degree course in the country for nursing, and almost 70 students are making their way through this high-tech program. Over the next decade, Qatar will need at least 5,000 more nurses, and with other nations also competing to hire top quality staff, some of this manpower will have to be homegrown. The complexity of healthcare is changing and getting more and more complex each year, so we need uh, well prepared nurses to do that. The illness burden, uh, especially here in Qatar and in the Middle East, illnesses of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, requires nurses. The aging population. So there are many, many reasons to really pay attention to nursing in Qatar. And what's our standard level of 
significance? But it's not just a question of getting enough medical students trained up. The government here wants more national staff to work in the country's health system too, a view shared by many Qataris. We are, as Qatari nurses, we, we can be more close than other nationality because related to our traditional and habits and religion, you know, our community is not uh, as big as people think. But there are many people, you know, and to follow the growth and development mostly, I think the Qatari nurses must teach the other nationality. Qatar has been quick to grasp the scale of what needs doing, but it's still a waiting game. It'll be a while yet before the billions of dollars it's spending will have a visible impact. Stephanie Hancock reporting from Qatar there. There's a delegation from Bermuda currently touring the Gulf to try to get investors to put their money there. The small tax-free island already has one of the biggest reinsurance markets in the world and it's trying to encourage more investors by creating Islamic friendly services. But for a region that already is competitive when it comes to Islamic finance, what does Bermuda have to offer? That's a question I put to Cheryl Packwood, Chief Executive of Business Bermuda. We're known as the risk capital of the world, and we are the number one captive domicile in the world. We also have a very thriving uh, investment sector, trust sector, private wealth management, which has been going on for years. What is interesting is with the whole global financial crisis, Bermuda has come out very well. We have maintained economic and political stability, uh, where others have increased debt uh, exponentially. Our debt to GDP ratio is only 11 to 14 percent. Uh, your money is safe. But what guarantees are there? There's no guarantees, and we've seen that with the Icelandic fallout. We've seen that uh, with many jurisdictions who have had numerous issues. Bermuda has weathered the storm. We've weathered it for hundreds of years, over the past hundred years, uh, in the development of the whole international business sector. Bermuda has served very well. We haven't, had, we haven't had the crises and the scandals of other jurisdictions. We've maintained a gold standard. You're also offering Islamic products and tools. Why would people go to you as opposed to, say, Bahrain, which is a hub here in the region? We have uh, several uh, Sharia compliant funds already domiciled in Bermuda. Um, we have had investments from this region going back decades. We're not here to compete with Bahrain. Bahrain is the, or Dubai, they are the financial centers within the region. We are here to work in conjunction, in collaboration with the financial centers of this region. We are the alternative when you decide to leave this region and you want to create wealth internationally. Why is this region important? This region is, it is an emerging market. Um, and there is a great deal of wealth here. Uh, there's a great potential for development here. We have the possibility to help in that development. The offshore world can be a massive part of the creation of wealth within the onshore world, within other centers, within other regions of the world. You create a company in Bermuda and the thousands of jobs that then can be created in the region from which that company came. It's just staggering, the possibilities. Uh, when you invest outside and then you create that capital and you bring it back in to create manufacturing companies, to create jobs within the region, it, the potentials are, are numerous. Cheryl Packwood of Business Bermuda speaking to me earlier. Now, the UAE has been working hard to move itself away from being an oil-based economy and it's tried to nurture its more creative side. This week, Dubai launched its very own cartoon network in Arabic, which is a mixture of cartoons that have been translated into the Arabic language, as well as Arabic animation, the most famous of which is Farij. Its characters have taken the region by storm, and its creator has great plans for the future, as Katie Watson found out when she went to meet him. Meet Um Saeed, Um Alawi, Um Saloum, and last but not least, Um Kamas. They're the four stars of Frij, which means neighborhood in Arabic. And hidden away in a traditional neighborhood of Dubai, these ladies have become the region's superheroes. <laughs> 
They don't have a cape, no special powers either. And the masks you see here are part of a traditional local dress, unlikely superheroes you may think. <laughs> While I was studying animation, our professor asked us to create a character that related to the culture we came from. I thought it was very easy because I came from a culture of Aladdin and Alibaba and all of these mythical characters that you know, the, uh, the big companies like Disney and DreamWorks worked on. And uh, when I sketched something that looked like a superhero from my culture, he's, the professor said, uh, you know, this is too cliche. I want something that relates to you now. But unfortunately, nothing related to me now. Um, you know, we, we grew up with no, uh, no people that we look up to. Unless you are somebody in business, then you have so many CEOs to look up to. And for me, it was very hard. And then I really dig deep into the culture. And I, 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 I chose the grandmother figure because back in the old days when our grandfathers used to go for pearl diving trips for six and seven months uh, and uh, it's it's the grandmother or the female figure that you know stayed in the land uh, raised the kids worked for a living taught them how to basically inserted morals in them and a grandmother figure which is most importantly is a figure that manages to advise you and insult you in the same sentence yes, Mohammed didn't start out in animation. He began studying architecture in the US, but it didn't last long. A visit to a cartoon lesson at university made him realize what he was missing. But it wasn't a decision his parents were happy about at first. My dad's reaction when I was kicked out of the university was, was not very good. And, uh, you know, I am more than a thousand miles away from him and uh, there is little he can do to control what uh, I wanted to do. His main, his main point was, and this is something that really affected my, my future, was that do whatever you want as long as you are happy and you come back with a degree. That kind of transformed my thinking because no longer do I have to please my parents. So you managed to go into the smaller... Uh, yeah, okay. When Mohammed got his degree and returned to Dubai, it wasn't easy getting the cartoon off the ground. He had to convince people to support his idea. Few thought it would work. And the latest challenge has been the downturn. This year, no new series was commissioned because the TV network couldn't afford it. It's the most expensive show to make in the UAE. But it's given Mohammed time to work on next year's series and on other projects, such as designing this safety announcement for an airline. Despite Frieda's success, Mohammed says he never set out with huge ambitions. For him, thinking local and remembering his roots was what was important. Focus on catering for the people you think you should cater for. And then if this happens to go international and go big, that's the icing on the cake. We never said, well, this is a show that we have to make and this show will go and conquer all countries and people will love us for who we are. No, this is a show that is a very intimate show for a special type of people, our culture, uh, who grew up thirsty for such materials. So what does the future hold? With a cartoon series as well as 400 different lines of cartoon-related products, from socks to dolls and picture frames, he's created a big local industry, one he hopes other people can learn from too. Katie Watson with the creator of Fridge there. Right, we're going to take a short break now, and when we come back we find out why Omani daggers are becoming very popular with women. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abu Arje. We're in the heart of Dubai's financial district. Over to Oman now, where the ceremonial dagger or khanjar is an integral part of the country's national dress. It's a prized possession that's passed down from father to son. But these days, the art of making it is dying out because they're mostly bought from countries like Pakistan and India. Well, now the Omani government is trying to revive that art, but more women are signing up than men. Philip Hampshire went to Oman to find out more. Classes have started at this training college in Muscat, Oman. The students here aren't learning maths or physics or chemistry. They're learning how to make kanjas, the traditional ceremonial dagger worn by men in Oman, Yemen, Fajira, Ras al Khaimah, and parts of Abu Dhabi. <laughs> I learned this profession because it's a good job and it's good to learn about your heritage. 
I didn't know anything about the Khanjar, but the authority taught us everything we need to know. So thank God, now I want to continue and take it further. Over the centuries, Khanjars have been made by men for men. They're passed down from grandfather to father to son. Most Khanjars in the country are now made in Pakistan or India, where the skills are still strong. The government feels that's a trend that needs to be reversed. The, the idea wasn't clear for the youth because they want really an easy job. They want to have profit as fast as possible and this is, doesn't um, exist in the crafts field because you have to go for training for a long time and then you have to practice what you have uh, learned during the training period and later on you have to understand the market. Omani's lost interest in traditional craft making like this Hanja belt when men realized there was more money to be made in oil or working for the government or indeed even in business. So almost all the people on the course are now women. That has a curious effect. It guarantees them the skills they need to get jobs or start their own companies if they want to. The main benefit is that I was able to develop some of the traditional Armani designs and I'm able to sell now in the market, which is good for me. Learning these traditional arts doesn't just allow them to make a single item though. Nima is using the skills she's learning to make watch straps, earrings, cufflinks and handbags. Like many of the women here, she dreams of opening a shop when she's done. I started through the Arts and Crafts Authority. They did the training for a year. After that, we started the design course. Then the authority opened up centers to help us sell our products. We also participated in international exhibitions and festivals. There we can showcase and sell our products. Shopping for a traditional hanja is an expensive business. In the suits around the town, most of the trade, like the manufacturing of the daggers, is now controlled by foreigners. Indeed, the people teaching the courses have had to be brought in from Pakistan to revive the skills here. Top quality hanjas sell for more than $1,000. So for the people learning this trade, it can be a lucrative source of income. Of course, the biggest market is with tourists looking for a somewhat cheaper version they can take back home to friends. But for people like Yakub, it's important the skill and sale of Khanjas be brought back to Oman. He's one of the few men taking the course. Well, my ancestors used to work in this craft. My father was a craftsman and I learnt it from him. I really like this job and I've inherited it from my father and before me he inherited it from his father and I will protect this craft and pass it on to my children just like my father did. The course is already beginning to see results. Fresh blood and ideas are flowing into the business. It may rekindle something not seen for many decades. The rejuvenation of the Hanja from a ceremonial item to a fashion accessory that shows a respectable link to Oman's ancient history. Philip Hampshire reporting from Muscat, the capital of Oman there. Now, this region has one of the highest rates of youth unemployment in the world. Most businesses offer jobs to people with a bit of experience. But now the region's biggest jobs website says that demand is picking up for fresh graduates. So is it a healthy market? That's a question I put to Lama Ataya from bait.com. The market certainly has a healthier pulse than it did a year and a half ago. There is more recruitment activity taking place. We see this across the board. Even in the hardest hit sectors, it's feeling healthier than it felt at the bottom of the recession. And which industries are looking to hire? Even some of the hardest hit sectors feel healthier today than they felt a year and a half ago. If you look at the number of jobs we have posted on our site, they include some of the hardest hit sectors. So we've got over 8,000 jobs advertised on a typical day, a similar number being filled without being advertised. They include industries ranging from FMCG, health, academia, and a few of the hard hit sectors, banking and finance, construction, property. There's volatility, there's hiring taking place to refocus, reshift strategy, and replace personnel who leave.
Now, this being the case that companies are strapped for cash, does this mean that an employee who asks for a lower salary gets the job? The trend that emerges is that there is a lot more demand for entry-level talent. So zero to three, three and a half, four years experience than there was prior to the recession. It's a more encouraging landscape for fresh graduates than it has been for quite some time. Cost consciousness very much contributes towards this. What also contributes towards this is there's a perception that the fresh grads bring a lot of zeal and enthusiasm and, and rigor to the jobs. So from what you're saying, is it a case that companies would like to hire people with experience but can't afford it? Employers are quite sophisticated in terms of benchmarking salaries. So every employer has a benchmarking system and it's, it's, the pay is very much, very much commensurate with, with the kind of responsibilities that the job entails. I don't think there is an undercutting game going on in the marketplace. Uh, salaries are set based on the skills desired and based on the rigors of the role and the qualifications being sought. Uh, it, it's not necessary to undercut. But you're talking about the, the higher levels of talent, those who are going to perhaps be managers. What about the mass market, people who are fresh graduates? The kind of talent we're seeing in the marketplace today dictates very much a flight for quality. Employers are not cutting corners when it comes to choosing the best candidates. Bates Lama'ataya speaking to me earlier. Well, our time is very nearly up. I do hope you've enjoyed our programme this week. But before we go, let's see how the region's main market finished the week. And remember, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the programme. Do email us. The address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co. UK. Now, next week, Abu Dhabi is hosting its annual film festival, and that's great news not only for the region's filmmakers, but also for local businesses that are benefiting from money being spent on the event. So, until then, from me, Nima Abuarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.